If we finally discovered Planet X, and I'm not talking about yet another Kuiper Belt ice ball, like Pluto, Haumea, Maki Maki, Eris, Kaor, Sedna, etc, etc, etc. This is a potential near Neptune sized planet. The catch? It hasn't actually been seen. Caltech planet hunters Mike Brown and Constantin Batigen have been on the trail of something big out there for some time. Now, Dr. Brown apparently wasn't satisfied as accomplice to the murder of Pluto, which was demoted to dwarf planet partly due to Brown's discovery of Eris, a distant planetary body that's larger than Pluto, and presumably is just one of many such rocks orbiting the Sun in the vast Kuiper Belt, out beyond Neptune. See, Brown also found Sedna, a minor planet whose elongated orbit takes it out way beyond the Kuiper Belt. It looks like it's been dragged out of the Kuiper Belt by the gravitational attraction of something. It was actually competing planet hunters, Chad Trujillo and Scott Shepard, who first noticed that several Kuiper Belt objects have these elongated orbits, orbits that are roughly aligned with each other in the axis of their elongation. They suggested the possibility of a large planet out there, dragging on these objects with its gravitational pull. But it was Brown and Batigen who first ran the exhaustive computer simulations and found a single compelling solution. A very, very distant giant planet with a mass well over 10 times that of the Earth and a stretched out eccentric orbit with a period, a year length, of 15,000 Earth years and an average distance to the Sun of 700 astronomical units. That's 700 times the Earth's average orbital radius, placing it far outside the Kuiper Belt. Given its mass, the best guess is that it would also be a gas giant, something like Neptune or Uranus. It could be smaller, but it could also be larger. However, until we spot it, we can only guess what it looks like, or even whether it exists. Now, the alignment of those weird Kuiper Belt orbits is pretty unlikely to have happened randomly, a 0.007% chance to be precise. So it seems pretty likely that something is out there. Now, people have claimed the discovery of Planet X before. Apparent discrepancies in Uranus's and Neptune's orbits, which have now been debunked, nonetheless led to the original discovery of Pluto which is way too small to affect the gas giants anyway. But did we really find Planet X this time? To quote Mike Brown, This is different, because this time, we're right. Existing telescopes should be able to see this thing, even if we don't know exactly where to look. But believe me, we'll be looking. OK, time for the answer to our photon clock challenge question. We asked you whether according to your perception, a clock, or a photon clock, travelling towards you at 50% of the speed of light would seem to have a tick rate that was slower, faster, or the same as one that's moving away from you at the same speed. The answer? Faster. Why? Because of the relativistic Doppler effect. The relativistic Doppler effect classically changes the wavelengths of light blue shifting approaching material and red shifting receding material, but it also affects clock rate. See, special relativity tells us that a clock that's moving relative to you will have a slower tick rate compared to a clock that's stationary in your own reference frame. However, that's based on a sort of instantaneous comparison of the timelines of the two clocks. To determine the observed tick rate, you also have to factor in the travel time of light. The best way to illustrate this is with a space-time diagram. For a refresher on how these work, check out this episode. OK, so a photon clock that's stationary on the space-time diagram moves straight up. By definition, ticks correspond to intervals on our time axis. Now a clock that first moves towards the observer and the stationary clock overtakes and then moves away will have ticks that occur at a less frequent rate when viewed from the stationary frame. That's regular time dilation. But what does someone in the stationary frame actually see? To understand that, you need to draw light-like photon paths between the moving clock and the stationary observer. Where those paths intersect the vertical world line, 
tells you the observed time interval between the ticks. See? When the clock is approaching, its ticks are more clustered than when it's moving away. So the approaching clock ticks faster than the receding clock. And this is just a complicated way of saying that the approaching clock sort of chases after its own photons, condensing the distance between the light signals that carry those ticks, while the receding clock is backing away from the photons traveling in your direction, stretching out the distance and hence the time between tick signals. I also asked an extra credit question. Does the approaching clock appear to tick faster, slower, or at the same rate compared to a stationary clock? To answer this, you actually need some math. One effect, time dilation, slows down the tick rate of the approaching clock. At the same time, the relativistic Doppler effect speeds it up. So which effect wins? Time dilation will slow a moving clock down by this, one over the square root of one minus velocity squared over c squared. That's the Lorentz factor. The relativistic Doppler effect will speed up an approaching clock by one over one minus v on c. Combine these and you get what we call the Doppler factor, which looks like this. The length of the observed second decreases by this factor for an approaching clock and increases for a receding clock. Our clock is moving at 50% the speed of light, so this comes out to d equals the square root of 3. The approaching clock appears to tick around 73% faster than your own stationary clock, while the receding clock appears to tick 42% slower than your clock. If you figure just the time dilation and not the Doppler effect, you get that the moving clock is always around 13% slower than your clock, whether approaching or receding. By the way, this is an effect that we see out there in the universe all the time. Quasar jets pointing towards us appear crazily bright and they pulsate much more quickly than they should because our sense of their time is compressed. At the same time, supernovae that are moving away from us due to the expansion of the universe appear to die away far more slowly due to the combined effect of time dilation and the Doppler effect. Okay. So many of you got the first part of this right and for the right reason. We chose three random entries from those to get brand new space-time t-shirts. Far fewer got both the first and the second parts right. And so to reward the extra credit kids, we selected three of you to also receive t-shirts. So more work means a better chance. If your name appears on the list below, please email us at pbsspacetime at gmail.com with your name, mailing address and typical US t-shirt size. Small, medium, large, extra large, etc. Also, let us know if you prefer an I'll science any question I want t-shirt or a black hole orbits t-shirt. For those of you who missed out, we'll have more challenge questions in the future, but we'll also have more t-shirt designs. So don't be shy about supporting the show by clicking on the link below for your very own space-time t-shirt. And I hope you'll join us next week for a brand new episode of Space Time.